right now, why don't we stand to our feet? Because um, tonight we are about to hear the Word of God and um, we're finishing a series which we've been running through October called Letters to the Church. And uh, I'm stoked tonight that Mike Winnington is going to be bringing the last part of this series. So Mike is part of our team. And would you give Mike a big round of applause as he comes to bring the Word? Thanks, mate. Go for it. Awesome. Hey, you can be seated. Brilliant. Sorry, I, um, I broke my glasses, so I've got servo glasses tonight, so um, I apologise for that. <clears throat> Makes me look like a nerd, but... <clears throat> Very good. As Dustin said, tonight we are, are concluding uh, this series, Letters to the Church. Um, how many have loved this series? I don't know about you, but I've, I've, I've got so much uh, out of this series personally. Uh, and, uh, and so we're, tonight we're going to be looking at the final and last uh, church in the book of Revelation here. Uh, and I just want to, before we uh, do that, I just want to recap on the last uh, six churches that we have, um, that we have looked at. And, uh, and what, what we're doing today is... is in this age and in this time, we are typically known or we're living in what is called the church age. Uh, basically, that just means that uh, when Jesus uh, ascended into heaven uh, and uh, he handed the baton over to the church uh, and said, now is the time for ministry. Uh, and so we live in this age where we are called uh, disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, and, um, and he hands this baton of ministry over to the church. Uh, and so you can read about that in the book of uh, in the in the book of Acts. And so the New Testament church was born, and we now represent Christ in the world. That, that we are His ambassadors, and so we're living in now what is called the Church Age. This time period between the ascension, Jesus' ascension into heaven, uh, and just before His return again. And so this time period that we are, uh, are in is, is actually, uh, that we're living in, is typically found in Revelations chapter 1, 2, uh, and 3. Uh, and in these chapters, uh, Jesus dictates seven letters to this church in this age. Uh, the actual churches, they were located in Asia Minor, uh, or what is today modern-day Turkey. Um, these are literal churches, I've just said. Uh, in the first century. Uh, these were literal letters uh, that were dictated to the pastors of these churches, uh, intended to be read to each of these churches. And so when we read through these letters or when we've studied uh, these letters uh, as we've done this, this month, uh, we can draw a spiritual application uh, on the truth of what Jesus revealed here to these specific churches. Uh, and so in this series, uh, I don't know if you remember, but the first message we looked at was the uh, church in Ephesus. And in each one of these um, churches, uh, Jesus gives a commendation uh, and he gives a complaint. But there's also a spiritual application for us living in today. And so in Ephesus, he, he said that they served faithfully, that they were faithful Christians, even though they endured hardship. Uh, they had a love for sound doctrine and they had a dislike for heretics. But even though uh, they were dutiful, even though they were faithful, even though they were a biblical church, Jesus said this of them, that they had lost their first love. They had forsaken their first love. And so uh, the spiritual application that, that we could take from this letter for each and every one of us, we could ask the question, have I lost my first love? Have I forsaken my first love? And if I have, will I fall in love with the person of Jesus Christ afresh? The second uh, letter that we looked at, the second church, was the church in Smyrna. Uh, uh, the Bible talks about this church being afflicted and poor and persecuted. But Jesus said of this church that they were spiritually rich. They were faithful. Uh, and the encouragement that Jesus gives to this church, that amidst their persecution amidst the hardship that they were going through, that they were to be faithful, that they were not to fear. And Jesus gives no complaint of this persecuted church. 
And so we draw from um, Smyrna, we could, uh, that when persecution comes into our lives, will I be faithful? Will I run to God and not from God? When I run to the one is, who is eternal, it is he who gives me strength to endure in the temporal. The third church or the third letter that we uh, studied was the letter to Pergamum. Uh, and it says that they didn't deny their faith despite the martyrdom of Antipas. Uh, the, the Bible says of Antipas that he was this faithful witness. History, not the Bible, but outside the Bible, history tells us that Antipas was roasted alive in a brazen, bull-shaped altar because he wouldn't deny the faith. He wouldn't compromise on the truth. But there's this complaint to this church. That, they had, that the church and the world ended up in a marriage. And the church of Pergamum was seduced into a culture of compromise. And so the spiritual application we could draw from uh, this church is that just as Jesus shares his own title, faithful witness with Antipas, will I be a faithful witness to a culture that is seduced by compromise? Thyatira was our uh, next uh, part of the journey, and, uh, and this was a church that was commended for growing in love, growing in faith, uh, growing in the service and, and perseverance. But here's the complaint, that they were tolerant. They tolerated compromise, and, and, and they tolerated anti-biblical teaching to fit comfortably within the culture in which they lived. And so, here in this church, we could have the takeaway that one might take away from this, this letter to Thyatira is, will I change the word of God to fit my culture or will I allow the word of God to change me? Sardis was the fifth uh, letter we looked at and Jesus has no real encouragement for this church, um, but he had a lot of complaints. Uh, this, this was a church, he said, that you look alive outwardly but inwardly, it was spiritually dying and dead. And so the application here was, when I no longer live in the power of, the, of Jesus' spirit, the forms of Christianity may remain, but the inner reality is really gone. And, and that, that we're not to let go of the presence and the power of the Spirit of God, but we keep responding to His movements, uh, to keep on being filled with the, with the Holy Spirit, like Ephesians said, to adjust the sails of my life so that they're continually being filled with the breath of God. Dustin brilliantly spoke about Philadelphia this morning. It was a church that kept God's word, that they didn't deny His name. This was another church that Jesus has no complaints with. There's no complaint. There's no word of correction with this church. Jesus doesn't say, I have this against you. Uh, uh, the church of Philadelphia had not lost its first love. It remained loyal under pressure and persecution. They weren't tolerant of ideas contrary to the gospel. They boldly confessed Jesus, as Dustin spoke about this morning, a missionary church, and, 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 and before them stood this open door. Here was my spiritual application for this morning. I had to take notes to get this one. But my takeaway from this letter was, am I looking for doors of opportunity? Am I living on mission? And how do I contextualize that, 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 that mission for the times that I live in? And that would I have a fresh revelation of his strength? In my life. And so this brings us to the seventh and final church of our study, that being the church of Laodicea. So if you've got your Bibles tonight, I'd ask that you take them out to uh, open them to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to read from verses 14 through uh, to 22. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you, I wish that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. 
I have prospered. I have need of nothing. Realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and, uh, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and a salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you tonight for your word. I pray, Lord, that we would uh, take uh, spiritual application uh, away from this letter to the church of Laodicea. Lord, it's a hard word, uh, but Lord, we also see that there is great grace uh, that is given to this church. Lord, I pray that great grace would be upon all of us in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let me just give you a little bit of historical background uh, to this church and just to what we've read. Uh, just in order to get a fragment of, of context to what's happening, what's going on in, uh, in this church here in Laodicea. Um, as already said, and like all the other churches, Laodicea uh, is a literal church in the first century placed in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. It was founded in the mid-third uh, century BC. In fact, um, Laodicea became an incredibly wealthy city. Uh, it was located along a major Asian uh, trade route, uh, and it was situated in the Lacos Valley. Uh, it was noteworthy for a breed of sheep that produced glossy black wool, uh, which was spun into fine, expensive clothing, and it exported all across the then-known world. Now, all of this background is important. Because Jesus is going to do something uh, in this uh, letter to the uh, Laodiceans. Uh, He's going to make a play on words here when he rebukes this church. And so I need you to keep in mind what's going on. So they had this breed of sheep and they produced fine clothing. Um, but Laodicea was also known for its physicians. It was also known for its medical schools. And the Laodicean physicians, try and say that a few times, um, had developed the salve for curing eye disease. And, and, and despite the wealth, and, and Laodicea had become, as I said, very, very wealth, wealthy, especially by 96 AD when this letter has been penned. Uh, it had many credit-worthy uh, banks and profitable banks. In fact, it had its own mint where they um, uh, minted money. Yet despite all of that, fresh drinking water was scarce. La Laodicea actually lacked local, a local water source, and the water had to be piped in via an aqueduct system of stone uh, pipes from a sister city uh, just to the north called Heropolis. Um, Heropolis was actually famous uh, for its hot medicinal springs. Uh, and so by way of aqueduct, they would uh, bring this hot water from Heropolis down from the, uh, the north to Laodicea, uh, and as this hot mineral water would travel along this aqueduct, it would gradually become lukewarm. As well as that, um, the history records from this aqueduct system that it would become quite putrid, that there would be this white encrustation of calcium carbonate that would, would build up in the pipework. Uh, and it would become putrid, and often travelers would take a sip and then spit the water out. Just to the south, of Laodicea was another sister city, uh, the city of Colossae. You may know, know that where Paul wrote the uh, letter to the Colossians. Um, this is just to the south. Uh, and this city was known for its cold, refreshing spring water. The, the water of Laodicea was neither hot nor cold. It was neither uh, hot healing water or cold, refreshing water. And all of this is significant, and the background is, is important to understand because the language that Jesus uses to this church is intentional. 
And um, uh, biblically, um, uh, Laodicea, it's um, a church that's mentioned four times in the book of Colossians, uh, but no other uh, details are given about it or, or the city. Um, Paul actually mentions in his letter to the Colossians um, of a letter that he wrote to the Laodiceans um, and uh, he mentions this letter, but we don't have any record of, of, of that letter today. Uh, spiritually, Laodicea was a very complicated place. Uh, multiple gods and go- goddesses were worshipped uh, there. Temples are built for Zeus, Apollos, uh, Aesculapus, the god of healing, uh, the gods of, uh, and goddesses of Hades, Hera, Athena, uh, Serapis, Dionysus, the god of wine. And other deities were all worshipped in this, in this city. It was a very polytheistic culture. Uh, there was also the worship of the emperor there, which was part of the political nature of the time. And so there's some historical background to the context of Laodicea. Now, the, this leads us from a historical context of first century to the text of scripture that we have just read. The letter has been penned by the Apostle John. Uh, John, years of his life, after being boiled alive in a vat of oil, but refusing to die. And so they exiled him to the island of Patmos. And according to tradition, at this time when this letter is written, John is the last apostle left. All the other apostles have died a martyr's death. Whether it would have been run through with a spear crucified by Roman soldiers, impaled on iron hooks, hung upside down, or been thrown off the temple wall and then clubbed to death. Others were cut to pieces, beheaded. One was flayed to death with a whip, and one was crucified upside down because this disciple told his executioner that he was unworthy to die the same way that Jesus did. Can I just say to you, The gospel that we receive today, the the, the word of God that we have, this this book that we have, it's not a lukewarm gospel. It's not cheap. It cost some people some things. And so John, now an old man, dictates this letter given to him by an angelic messenger. Let's have a look at the letter that John wrote. Let's just break this down. John introduces Jesus as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. See, when John, uh, when he says that he is the amen, what he is simply saying is that his words are valid and that they are binding. It's a Hebrew word that actually indicates uh, assent or confirmation of something that has been said. Uh, Unfortunately for us, amen is often just nothing more than a full stop at the end of a prayer. Yet in Hebrew thought and in Hebrew culture, uh, saying amen was a way of acknowledging that something is actually valid, that it is binding. Uh, Daryl Johnson uh, says this, when Jesus declares he is the amen, he is stating that he is the uh, trustworthy and solid foundation of life. He is the last word. See, maybe you're here tonight and you're a skeptic. Maybe you're here tonight and you're just not sure about Jesus. Can can I just say to you with all sincerity in my heart, Jesus is a trustworthy and sure foundation in which you can build your life off. He is also called here the faithful and true witness. Uh, There are two words that are translated true uh, in in the Greek language. Uh, The first is alethes, which simply means true versus false. Um, And the second word uh, is alethinos, which means genuine, the opposite of what is fictitious, the opposite of what is counterfeit or pretend. And it's this second word that John uses here, that he is saying that Jesus is not only a sure foundation that you can build your life off, he's not only trustworthy, uh, but he is genuine, he is real, he is not counterfeit, that he is 
the truth. And again, maybe you're here tonight and you're the skeptic and, or you're unsure of who Jesus is. Can I just say to you tonight that he is genuine, that Jesus is true, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is reliable, and that he is the truth. Finally, Jesus uh, is also referred to here in this uh, 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 title, the beginning of God's creation. Paul writes in Colossians, uh, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. That means that you and I were created by him, for him. E. Stanley Jones says, says it like this, the personality and the way of Jesus is not just written in the text of Scripture, oh, hello, but, but into every texture of our being. The personality and the way of Jesus is not just written into the text of Scripture, but into the very texture of every of our being, into the very texture of creation. Uh, as we've already mentioned, one of the familiar patterns with these, these letters was uh, uh, Jesus giving commendations or complaints. Uh, and one of the familiar patterns uh, when we looked at, through these letters is that when Jesus gave a commendation, he always uh, com uh, communicated that commendation first. But when it comes to Jesus' commendation of this church in Laodicea, Jesus has nothing good to say about it. There is no encouragement at all to this church. But he has a few complaints. And they start with this word, lukewarm. Now again, I give you all the background, I give you all the context, because you'll see here that Jesus makes a play on words. The hot mineral water that was piped down from the springs of Heropolis was lukewarm. And by the time it, it reached Laodicea, uh, it, it was lukewarm and, and putrid. How many like, or how many coffee drinkers, how many tea drinkers here? How, how many like lukewarm coffee? No one likes lukewarm coffee. Um, you know, um, cold is good, right? Um, you can get iced coffee, that's good. Um, you know, iced tea is good. Uh, if you're Tom Freeman, you will like cold brew. Um, they're all good things. Um, hot is good. Hot coffee is good. Hot tea is good. But lukewarm coffee and lukewarm tea, it's disgusting, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so is a lukewarm Christian. Hot and cold. I believe Jesus is saying both conditions are good. Both conditions are good. Most of us have heard that you're either a hot or, or you're cold. You know, you're, 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 you're on fire for God or you're far away from God. But I don't think that's what actually Jesus is saying here in this, uh, in this text. Remember, it's a play on words. Hierapolis, Laodicea's sister city, was famous for its medicinal hot springs. Colossae, Laodicea's other sister city, was known for its cold, refreshing spring water. And Laodicea had neither. It's a play on words shaped by geographical realities. Hierapolis had hot, healing water. Colossae had cold, refreshing water. Laodicea had none. In fact, Robert Mounts, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, writes this. The church in Laodicea was providing neither refreshment for the spiritually weary, nor healing for the spiritually sick. It was totally ineffective and thus distasteful to the Lord. And Jesus says to this church, I know your deeds. I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's how disgusting Jesus finds lukewarm Christians. See, lukewarmness is caused by a life of compromise. 
It's when we start to tolerate the compromises of a culture. When we start to tolerate the anti-biblical teaching to fit comfortably within the culture in which we live in, we start to become lukewarm Christians. Jesus' next rebuke of this church is quite interesting. The first rebuke was that they were lukewarm, but the second rebuke to this church was one was for their self-sufficiency. I, I don't know if you, you got that when we read the, the passage, but, but he, Jesus, uh, well, it says this, for you say, speaking to the church of Laodicea, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I have need of nothing. Um, in history, this area is, is quite known for its earthquakes. Um, Dustin mentioned it this morning in his message, but in 60 AD, there was an earthquake that completely demolished the city of Laodicea. The Roman government of that day um, uh, put together a stimulus package uh, and said that, that, that we'll come and, and we'll rebuild your city. But the Laodiceans proudly, history records, the Laodiceans proudly refused, saying, we have enough money for ourselves. We have many credit-worthy banks. And the Bible records it as, we have need of nothing. Remember, Laodicea was not only famous for its uh, wealth, but it was famous for its fine black wool, exporting garments all over the known world. Uh, and Laodicea was proud of the clothing and textile industry that it had. They were uh, proud to wear their designer clothes. And they would walk around, we have need of nothing. Laodicea was also famous for its physicians, as we've already said. The school that produced a, a salve for curing eye disease. And so Laodicea is the city that had wealth. It had fine clothing. It had medicine. And they proudly declared, the Bible says, that they have need of nothing. That we are rich. We have prospered. And Jesus rebukes them for this. This is what Jesus says in his rebuke to them. He calls them a few names. He says that you are wretched, that you are pitiable, that you are poor, that you are blind, and that you are naked. He uses these words to describe this church's spiritual condition. Again, you see a play on words happening here. See, Jesus says you are poor. Even though they had many banks with gold in their safes and a textile industry that imported fine clothing and carpets all over the known world, Jesus says you might be materially rich, but you're spiritually poor. He says you're blind. Even though they were in an area known for this expensive eye salve that provided constant healing for visual blindness, Jesus says you might have a remedy to help cure natural blindness, but they were spiritually blind. He says to them, you are naked. The black wool industry produces beautiful clothing. And Jesus says to them, though you are physically clothed, in reality, you are spiritually naked before me, that you are exposed before me. Okay, can I just pause for a moment and just, just say that the richness of a walk with Christ is much more valuable than any material possession that this world can offer you. Because, because you can lose everything in the world and still have Jesus. But if you lose Jesus, you've lost everything. And so what does Jesus do with this wretched church? It's quite incredible, really. Jesus, to this wretched church, church, he moves towards them. In the words of John Newton, it says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And this is what Jesus does to this church. He counsels them. He says, buy from me. It was just another game play on words because they would trade, but he said, buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. 
In other words, Jesus says to this church, he says, he is the one who has true riches. He is the one that will clothe us with robes of righteousness that will cover all of our shame. That he is the one that removes spiritual blindness and gives us spiritual eyes to see. See, this isn't just grace. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. In verse 19, it goes on to say, to those whom I love. Up until this point, you wouldn't have thought that he didn't thought much of them. But he says to this church, to those whom I love, I reprove, I discipline, so be zealous and repent. See, he still calls them to repent. Tomorrow is October 31st. It is often known as Reformation Day. We're on the 31st of October, 1517, 505 years ago tomorrow. Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to the Wittenberg Castle in protest to the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which literally begins the Protestant Reformation. And you and I have all been blessed by it. The opening line in this thesis is essentially this. All of a Christian's life is one of repentance. See, the big idea in, in, this, in, in that paragraph on that thesis was the big idea that is if you stopped repenting, we'd become lukewarm. And so Jesus calls this church to repent because he wants a relationship with them. Even the most wayward person, Jesus died for them so that he could have a relationship with them. And then in verse 20, Jesus adds a very familiar uh, a verse that we often quote. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The verse, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's been made famous by a, a painting by Holman Hunt. Uh, if you attend our Alpha course, you would uh, already know this. Uh, um, this is one of the uh, things that we use in the Alpha course. But um, Holman Hunt's painting of Jesus standing at a door. You may or may not notice uh, on that picture, but if you take a closer look, um, this door doesn't have a doorknob. There's no way Jesus can open this door. And the idea that Holman Hunt is presenting here is that if you really want a relationship with Jesus, that he is standing at the door and knocking. But you have to open and let him in. Usually you'll hear this um, quoted at, um, this verse quoted at evangelistic crusades or even in churches around an altar call time. And you usually hear it uh, something like this. Hey, Jesus is here today. He's knocking on the door of your heart. And I think it's appropriate. I think that language is appropriate. But we need to understand that Jesus did not speak these words first to unbelievers. He spoke them first to his church. They were spoken to so-called believers who thought they had it all together. It was spoken to a church that had locked Jesus out. It was spoken to a church that Jesus couldn't go to. It was spoken to a church that were excluding him from their lives. Maybe he was just too controversial. Maybe he was not willing to compromise. Maybe he was not tolerant enough. Catch cry of today. Maybe to them, he just made, they made them uncomfortable. See, my question tonight to you, church, is have you excluded Jesus from your life? And if so, would you invite him back in? Because when you invite him back in, there's this most incredible promise. Jesus goes on to say, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It's the greatest honor to dine with the king. Jesus not only makes that promise to us, but he goes on to say, the one who conquers, 
I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also have conquered and have sat down with my father on his throne. From now on, in the book of Revelation, right from now to chapter 4, right through to the, the very end, the throne becomes the dominant theme in the book of Revelation. But it's a throne in which sits a king. And to each and every one of us, we have the opportunity to belong to this king and his kingdom. See, we just need to turn the handle on the door, to submit to him, to follow him, to trust him, to repent of sin to him. See, the open, open the door to the one who is perfectly genuine. Open the door to the one who is real. Open the door to the one who is authentic, reliable, and true. Maybe you're here tonight, and, and you don't know this Jesus that we've talked about. You're not even sure uh, that you're the, about him. You're the skeptic. But in the title to this church, he was known as genuine, real, true, authentic, reliable, a trustworthy foundation. You know, tonight you may not even know this Jesus, and you're here sitting in this room. Can I just say, blessed are you. Blessed are you because you know what to do. You get to open the door because he stands at that door and he knocks. Will you turn the handle? Will you let him in? Maybe you're here tonight and you're in the church. You're serving on a team. You've been in church for a while or years. But like the Laodiceans, you've become lukewarm. You've allowed compromise to set in. I ask you tonight, will you turn the handle and open the door? Will you let him in? Maybe uh, you've, you, you're here uh, tonight and, and you've locked Jesus out because of a hurt. You've locked Jesus out because of a disappointment. My question to you is, will you turn the handle? Will you open the door again? And will you let him in and allow him to heal you? Maybe you're on staff here. Maybe you're on team. And, uh, and you've replaced relationship. Uh, you've re sorry, you've replaced busyness with relationship. Uh, sorry, you've replaced relationship with busyness. And the aqueduct that once flowed cold, refreshing water is starting to get dry. Maybe you're here tonight, and like the Laodiceans, you are feeling spiritually bankrupt, naked and blind. My question to you is, will you open the door? Will you let him come in? Will you receive the one that offers true riches? Will you receive the one who offers you a robe of righteousness that covers the shame? Will you receive the one who removes spiritual blindness and gives spiritual eyes to see? Maybe you're here and that you're just empty and that you're stale and dry. Will you open the door and let him back in? And allow what the in the final chapters of Revelation and what it says, will you allow the river of life that flows from his throne fill you, clean you, and wash you afresh? See, this church in Laodicea, there was a lot of rebuke, but there was amazing grace. And this amazing grace is offered to each and every one of us here tonight will we turn from our lukewarmness and become hot healing water or cold refreshing water to this world around about us let me pray father i just thank you for your word tonight i pray father god just as you offered uh, the, to this church of laodicea uh, lord uh, grace god that you would offer us grace. I pray for people here tonight, Lord God. 
Lord, that uh, may have, this was a hard word, and I understand that, but Lord, that you're there knocking on their hearts. I pray the Holy Spirit would go before them, would give them courage to unlock, to turn that uh, uh, doorknob and allow you to come in. In Jesus' name.